Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today this is a video for the FL Studio users and it's how to get the most out of your CPU when making music. So how to get your computer running a little bit less hot, how to stop your projects crashing and just maxing out the CPU meter. So I'm going to be sharing lots of tips and tricks. Some of them are very short, just a couple of clicks and it will fix a lot of problems. Others are a little bit more involved. For more information about all of these, just check the description. And I've also put my exact PC specifications down there because I know a lot of people keep asking me about that. So it's all there in the description. But for now, let's just dive right in. So let's start with some of the most simple ones that can make a huge difference. Firstly, FL Studio comes with lifetime free updates. So please, please update to the latest version of FL Studio 20. The CPU improvement in 20 versus 12 is absolutely huge. I've opened old projects in 12 and 20 and there's just a stark difference. And remember the updates are free for life, so make the most of it, download them. The next thing you can do that makes a huge difference, in the top left, go to your options, audio settings, then on the input and output, see which device you have selected. So if you're on primary sound driver, you'll want to change to one of the ASIO devices. So ASIO for all, FL Studio ASIO, maybe you've got a Scarlett or an Audient interface, so select the ASIO driver. The next thing you need to look at is the buffer length for your uh, sound card. So clicking this or double clicking usually pulls open uh, a, a menu where you can adjust the buffer length. In this case, for my Audient driver, I have to go into my setup and then change the ASIO size here, but some of them are just a slider, so take a look at that. If you have a longer buffer length, it's gonna give the CPU more time to process everything. It means that it's just gonna run a lot more smooth when you're mixing and mastering, at least. The issue for that is that if you want to play you know, a MIDI keyboard or record vocals and hear yourself back in real time with effects, it's not gonna work for you at all. If you're just mixing and mastering, you know, you can increase the buffer length quite a lot. However, if you're recording and tracking, you're gonna have to go down a little bit lower. So just for the sake of demonstration, if I lower my buffer length to 32 samples and press play during the chorus where I've got lots of virtual instruments and I'm also running this screen recorder, uh, my CPU percentage is getting pretty high, 64, 70%, something like that. Whereas if I now select a much longer buffer size, buffer length, and I press play again, uh, we've got substantially lower CPU, so 30 to 40. Very quickly going over a few other settings, the sample rate of your project. So I'm usually at 44.1. Sometimes I have to work in 48 for a client. Those are pretty much industry standard. If you start increasing a lot, especially when you're starting out, you're really not going to get much benefit at all at these higher sample rates, besides for a few specific tasks. So if you are just picking a larger number because you think it's better. Maybe do a little bit of research and see what really is best for you and your computer. Next thing, you can click mix in buffer switch and triple buffer. That often helps with some sound cards. Sometimes it actually doesn't, so just try them. You'll find out. And then going down to the CPU panel, make sure that you have multi-threaded generator processing, mixer processing, and smart disable. These three, at least, I would keep those on all the time. They seem to work really well for me. What these do is let FL Studio use all the cores or, or more cores of your CPU because your CPU is, you know, multi-threaded. It has multiple cores, multiple logical processors. Selecting these lets all those processors be used together, which often, you know, means that the CPU has less load on any one particular core. Going down to the mixer, the resampling quality. I don't actually find this affects my machine a lot, but when I had my old laptop, it made quite a big difference. Uh, sometimes if these are set too high, it really drags the whole system down. So I would keep it, you know, somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the average quality. A few other quick clicks you can make that make a big difference. Go over from the audio tab to the project tab. I would advise setting a data folder for your project no matter what you're working on. I find it helps things run smoother and not crash as much. And what this means is that all the WAV files and everything associated with your project will be stored into a folder that you've chosen as opposed to just the general user folder on your PC. So you just click this button here and you can choose any uh, folder in your PC to save this to. I find that helps, but the real thing I wanted to show you was in the time settings here, time base, PPQ, you want to make sure that this isn't too high. I've set it to 96 for this tutorial. Usually I work in a rather high time base. So if I'm at 100, uh, 960, what this means is that when I'm making edits, say I want to zoom in on this, these drums here, I can zoom in incredibly close and really see what's going on and make very fine edits. But it also means that the CPU has to do absolutely tons more. Whereas if I go back to the project and change this to, say, a lower value like 96, 
Now that I've zoomed in on those drums, you'll see that I can't zoom in even quite as close as I could before. So you don't get quite the editing resolution, but often most of the time when you're mixing and mastering, you don't need a crazy, crazy high resolution. And this makes a, a dramatic difference to the CPU. If I have my time base set to 960, my CPU is going to be up around 68%, 60% or so. Whereas if I lower that to uh, 72, the CPU usage is maybe 30%, 40%, so a significant improvement. The last quick trick before we uh, head into some of the more involved ex examples is to go into the tools here, macros, and then purge unused audio clips. Doesn't necessarily save CPU, but it definitely saves RAM. So what this means is that if you've got audio clips in your project, maybe previous samples you were bouncing out and testing, and they're not being used in your project anymore, if you press that button, it will find all of those unused clips and just delete them from your project. I find that when my projects get really, really cluttered, really large recording projects, this just frees up the RAM. And then once the RAM has a lot more to work with, you know, it just means the whole machine runs a bit smoother. So it's not necessarily just for CPU, but it does get things running a lot smoother. And right underneath this, there's an option for switch smart disable for all plugins. And smart disable is, it means that if a plugin's not being used, it just kind of turns it off. So right now you see that my CPU is hovering at about 16%, even though nothing's playing. So if I switch smart disable, it will drop down to hopefully almost nothing, but I do have a screen recorder on. So that's taking up a little bit. And it means that uh, when you stop your project or, or you're playing in a part of a project where a certain VST isn't being used or certain plugins not being used, it will just, you know, turn it off as opposed to just keeping it constantly running in the background. This makes a pretty big difference. The next couple of examples are about specific plugin settings because plugins are really CPU hungry, especially things like Serum. So I have this pad here that's playing with 16 voices of unison. It's a really nice lush pad. But 16 voices of unison is going to be taxing my computer a lot, so I should really ask myself, do I need 16, or could I do it with less? 11 still sounds good, really nice and wide. 7 sounds great. If I go down to 2, it's really not the same sound, but you can find a balance. And, you know, I think that just using 7 voices of unison sounded just as good as 16 and that's going to save the processing a ton. The next thing to do is to dive into the plugin settings. So at the top here, for instance, if you open this uh, this uh, cog here, you can see that you have some settings here and you can make sure that on the processing, you allow threaded processing for this VST. You know, if that's not checked, your CPU is just not going to be using all of its resources to process this sound. If I go back to the main tab again, let's look at some quality settings within each plugin. These are going to be hidden slightly differently for each plugin, but in Serum, it's the global tab. And right now I've got the oscillator setting at four times quality. So let's simply take a listen to all of these different options. Four times quality. Two times. They're really, really close. And then one times. So that first one, the draft mode really was awful. That doesn't sound good at all. I wouldn't recommend using that. But between two and four, I can save twice as much and it sounds pretty much exactly the same. So I would probably work with two, you know, drop in the quality a little bit. It's not going to make a massive uh, difference, but I wouldn't recommend going onto the draft mode because then you really lose a lot of the, the resonance and the, the, the spirit and the quality of the sound there. However, something to note about the quality and the sort of oversampling is that there's many uh, mixing plugins where you actually you don't want to lower the oversampling too much because especially in distortion and equalization plugins, uh, if you lower that, they just don't sound good at all. So I, I'm not necessarily saying use draft mode on everything, but try to find a good compromise. Following a similar theme with the plugins, uh, I know everyone says layer your sounds, layer, 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 but you've got to ask yourself, you know, could I do more with one or two of these layers? Could I thicken out these two layers instead of making five layers? Because if you have five patches of a synth, it's going to use five times more. Sometimes I hear a sound that's really, really thick and full, and I've asked the producer how it was made, and it was just one patch of serum. Whereas other tutorials online say layer, 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 and they're saying, you know, use four or five layers, when actually the producer themselves only used one layer. Do what sounds best. Don't just layer stuff because everyone else says so. Now let's take a look at our mixing and sound design plugins. And plugins are really, they're the ones that really eat your CPU up. They really, really do, especially mastering plugins. So something I'd recommend is to try to minimize the number of plugins you use. If you have, say, all 10 effect slots full up, it's likely that you're just doing too much to the sound unless you're doing something very advanced with sound design. 
So I'd say try to minimize a little bit. One thing that helps a lot is creating reverb uh, and delay sends, which is a very, very common technique. I have a video linked here. And this is where you uh, open up a reverb or a delay on one channel. And then every time you need a reverb on a sound, you just send a bit of the sound to that channel. It adds some reverb and sends it to the master for you. And that way you don't have to open up, say, 10 or 20 reverbs in your whole project. You could just open up a handful and save a huge amount of CPU that way. But something that I see a lot of my students doing is having their master effects loaded up and turned on all the time. You don't need to be producing through a huge amount of master effects. When you're mixing, it's really beneficial to have some mastering effects turned on, some compression, maybe a tape machine. But when you're producing a track, if you have loads of mastering effects on and your CPU isn't keeping up, just turn them off. You know, for instance, if I press play on my chorus here with all these mastering effects turned on, my computer's up at 60-70% again. If I turn off all of these mastering effects, we're down to 30%, 35, maybe touching 40. So we're saving a huge amount of CPU just by turning off those mastering effects and doing the mastering later when the time's right. Again, I have a mastering tutorial linked here, which can walk you through that whole process. Now we're gonna take a look at bouncing out some of the instruments. So turning some of the MIDI into audio instead. So let's look at some of these tracks that we should consolidate, which is when you print out the whole track, whether it was from audio files or MIDI, we're gonna consolidate it into one new track. So if I'm on the playlist and I've got some kicks here, it's not gonna be that beneficial to print those out uh, as one new WAV file. But if I have you know some synth generators up here, especially ones from large sample libraries, I'd recommend starting with that. So I have a strings pattern here, which is from a contact instrument called Analog Strings. And it sounds really, really great, but this is a really, really CPU intensive plugin. So this is something that I would recommend printing out. So let's take a look at how we do this. There's several ways. The first is really, really simple. You go over to the picker panel here, make sure that you have patterns selected, go down to your pattern, right click. There's a few options, quick render as audio clip, render as audio clip or render and replace. So I would recommend using render as audio clip or render and replace. So if I press render and replace, I can select a quality. I'm going to choose 24. I'm going to up the resampling a little bit and uh, I'm just going to press start. And what you'll see is that once this uh, goes through, which is usually pretty quick and just like that, my MIDI clip, which would have been here has been replaced with this single audio file. Now, if you want to, you can go back into your channel rack and you could delete that instrument, which would help the project, or you can just leave it there not doing anything. This new audio file, you can find it in the picker panel audio clips and it will be uh, one of them just here. Another way to print out uh, something. So I've got this uh, smooth pad here. What I can do is simply select it on the playlist. And this is just a left click control and drag. Then I find where it's sent to on the mixer, which is this one here, smooth pad. I can choose to render it with or without the effects. I select uh, this here and then I just press alt and R and it gives me some options. Do I want to cut the remainder, leave the remainder? I'm going to leave that. What bit depth do I want? Press start, should render it really, really quickly. And then my audio file should be somewhere on the playlist, usually just below. Okay, here we go, smooth pad. So I can just drag it up in place. I'm just going to insert a new clip here and drag my smooth pad up. So this is the same as the MIDI. And then what you might want to do is turn off some of those mixer effects because you don't need them now because you've already printed those effects into it. And that's going to save you a lot of CPU processing in that synth. It will slightly increase the amount of memory your project needs. So if you do this too much, you might start eating up your RAM. But at the end of the day, you're dealing with one WAV file as opposed to thousands upon thousands of uh, calculations every second for your CPU. And I quite like the peace of mind of knowing that my sound is all printed and it's very sort of like fixed and I can then work with it more as opposed to constantly relying on these calculations all the time. If you want to, you can keep this MIDI here. Just press T on your keyboard and you can just mute all those clips and then you can still play everything along. So if you if you decide later, you know, maybe you want to add a different note to the chord, you could still just add another note in and then reprint this WAV file out. So there's no stress about not being able to go back and work with it in the future. Let's look at a few things you can do outside FL Studio to optimize your computer. So I'm going to open up my task manager here. That's control alt delete and then task manager. And let's take a look at what's going on. So right now I've got my screen recorder on, which is really killing my CPU, very, very high power usage. But uh, in the background, there's all these background processes. And man, this is actually terrifying how much stuff is on right now. But, you know, if there's, you know, like a creative cloud thing going on, or if there's, you know, Cortana sitting there on Microsoft Edge is, is on there, like you can just 
hit these, get them to end the task, and it'll probably free up a little bit of a little bit of your resources. Some of them are very, very minimal though, so don't don't go too crazy with that. And another thing to do is to look at your performance, and then you can actually see what your CPU is doing, what your memory is doing. So, you know, in this case, I can see that I've got a lot of memory being used. I am doing the screen recording, as I said. Uh, and this can give you a good indication of what's actually going on with your CPU, as opposed to just what FL Studio's meter is telling you. And finally, I would go to the startup and see what is loading up as you uh, turn your computer on. For instance, I disabled Discord from starting because every single time I turn my computer on, Discord just used a chunk of the resources to get going. And, you know, sometimes you don't need everything to uh, to start when you turn your PC on. So you could say, you know, actually, I don't want Discord to start when I first turn it on. I don't want Google Chrome to load up when I first turn it on, something like that. Um, I disabled Spotify from loading up right away because it was a high startup impact. So those sorts of things can really smooth out the whole computer experience. And finally, whether you're using a laptop or a tower, I would recommend cleaning out the, the fans and the ports on it quite regularly. It's easier with a computer, obviously, like a tower PC. But I find myself, you know, I open the front panel, I pull out the filters, I clean the fans on a weekly basis just to make sure that the cooling is all being effective. Because if, if your computer is not managing to cool the CPU, it's not going to manage to do a lot with it. I'm very blessed to live in Scotland, so it's always freezing in my studio anyway. But if you live in a hotter climate, you know, um, it, it makes a huge difference. And if you're working on a laptop especially, the fans are usually really ineffective. So anything you can do to raise your laptop up and let some air get around the body and into the fans makes an enormous difference. If you can, you know, make yourself a cheap laptop stand or maybe invest in a good one that has fans on it. Back in the day when I was producing on that sort of more inexpensive laptop, really, it was a really cheap HP pavilion. I would sometimes, you know, I'd, I'd be sticking like bags of peas under there and I'd be raising it up on books, just trying to do anything to get a little bit more, a little bit more performance out of it. So I really can and sort of uh, empathize with uh, people that are on machines like that. Anyway, I hope this guide has helped a little bit. If you have any other tips and tricks that you figured out along the way, do leave them in a comment in the comment section, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye for now.